This conference um, will now be recorded. Business approach to mental efficiency, which is a very unique, innovative way to make this happen. Some of the critical research and then our results and then our conclusion and some uh, time for questions and answers. So basically, this is my background. It's very unique. Um, I developed this very, very specialized methodologies to help organizations become more efficient. Um, very specialist in project rescue, which required very fast results um, by focusing on the core processes that were that were um, important to the operations of whatever environment it was. It didn't matter what company or sector, we could make a, a pretty significant improvement in processing, uh, in operational processing. So the unique challenge came in 2006. My brother, who was uh, stationed in Iraq, had two IEDs blown up, um, two vehicles blown up from under him from IEDs. Um, and IEDs, if you follow the news, are still the most devastating weapons the insurgents have against us because there could be, uh, you know, a bomb under some garbage in the corner somewhere and a trigger man a mile away. And without seeing that or knowing that, it's very dangerous for our troops. So my brother came back, he said, Hey, can you help? And so, I looked at the entire situation, where we were in terms of helping, where we were in terms of research, where we were in terms of the military and actually where they were um, in their current, uh, technology to try to defeat IDs. What I found was the problem with research at the time was that almost all of the mental experiments to try to help the guys over um, in combat were psychology based. You know, there were um, <clears throat> cognitive task analysis. There were um, Gary Klein was um, probably one of the pioneers in uh, recognition crime decision making. A lot of studies. The problem was in an asymmetric environment that the Marines faced. Research was never going to get there in time to where it needed to be. Long research cycles, as you know, eight to, to seventeen years. But lives are at stake, and so critical factor was time. So. Um, the Marines were willing to take a risk on anything that possibly might be able to help. So I was able to get to an event out at 29 Palms, which is the Marines' largest training um, facility. Um, it was called IED Industry Day, and the whole purpose of this was to bring people um, from all over the world, basically, contractors who might have some sort of solution to the IED problem. What occurred to me, though, and, and they, you know, they took us through all kinds of exercises and they had us try to experience in a long weekend what the Marines had to. But what critical, the critical observation to me was a survivor's intuition. So what happened was uh, we'd go around these different exercises and our guides were Marines who had actually survived IED blasts. And the consistent um, report they would give was I started to go down this one alley or this one into this one building. Something told me something was wrong. I went a different way and the guy behind me got blown up. So why two Marines, same demographics, same training, why does one have better what we would call intuition? Um, if you've ever read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, he calls it thin slicing, the ability to observe, process unconsciously and execute on that. So the unique eureka moment to me was, hey, what if, we could apply the same type of methodology we're applying to operational processes to the brain and use the use neuroplasticity as the medium. So I was able to present that to General Stone, who was the base commander. Anyone else never would have gotten past him. He had been in business before. He'd been CEO of a couple of companies as, as a reservist. He knew what I was trying to get. So what if we could do that? What if we could make the brain more efficient um, focusing on the critical processes the same way we did for businesses. So an example of that would be um, our basic project management methodology, for example. Um, define, design, deliver, right? You guys have projects, probably you have to do, right? You have to define what all the issues are, what the requirements are. You have to design a way to accomplish that, and you actually have to deliver it. And what keeps projects on track is change control. So for the brain, we just translated that to break it down, think it through, and execute. Because no matter what we're doing, whether we're in combat or we're sitting in front of a desk, there's data constantly coming into our brains. So we have to break it down, filter out what's not important, think through what's left, and execute on that, right? Execution is key. And what keeps us on track is focus and attention. So this is what we want to target. We want to target the break it down, think it through, and execute process, and, and also improve focus and attention as a way to make that more efficient. 
So our goal is really something we call cognitively prime anticipation, which is another term really for intuition. We want the break it down, think it through piece to be happening as a system one process, thinking process, right? Unconsciously, the brain is gonna be breaking it down, think it through, and then the conscious only needs to pull up information that's relevant to that decision in that moment, and then be able to make that decision. So that was the goal. This was kind of the model we were trying to, to create. Now the Marines also had some very unique requirements. The exercises had to be portable. They had to be able to fit in their pocket. They had to be able to learn very quickly, which meant a very simple interface, and they had to be used during white space without negatively impacting existing schedules. In other words, we didn't have time to schedule any type of brain training time. They had to be able to be fit into their, their white space. They had to be performed independently, and they had to be led by NCOs. There was no way to get you know, trained psychologists or scientists or researchers to do this. Simple NCOs who trained anyway, they needed to be able to be empowered to lead the men with this. And it also had to produce well, results very, very fast. So in a way, this created this unique opportunity to bypass long research cycles and apply this and just to see if it would work. So our solution was um, a holistic, fully integrated program that improves the brain from so many different ways at a time. It had to be an interactive engaging interface or they wouldn't do it. Non-digital for, for rapid improvements. Um, it had to be progressively, they knew progressive resistance from lifting weights. The brain is the same way, right? Our brain responds to increasing load, it will respond physically to that load. So that had to happen. It had to be very easily performed. And it had to be able to be delivered in person or remote so we could deal with people who were already in combat using back then Skype. So our pilot study, uh, General Stone helped us get our pilot study, we had a contract to do this, um, and it was overseen by DOD. We had psychologists before and after um, checking everything. We had two platoons of Marines from 3rd Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 3rd uh, Marines, 2nd Battalion Golf Company. They were halfway through their seven-month Iraqi pre-deployment training. Um, so we started, we had two uh, groups, the, the test platoon, um, the training platoon, I asked for the worst performing platoon in the battalion uh, because if we made any difference at all, I wanted to help these guys. And the control platoon was just randomly chosen. So we had two different controls, two different um, platoons. Um, they all went through the exact same training regimen uh, for, the, for the duration of their training. Um, and we took a nonverbal um, abilities test, basically an IQ test before and after. So we'd have objective measures as well as any kind of subjective improvements we could make. Now, going into this, the critical research for us was out of MIT in 2007, where they found that robust stimulation, which we translate as non-digital, because non digital stimulation does not challenge the brain as much. Robust, in our interpretation, is using as many parts of the brain as possible that actually relate to the real world, because we wanted real world improvements. As one Marine general said to me, I don't care what the numbers on the test say, if these guys don't perform better, you're out of here. So this was very critical to us that these changes could happen so quickly. Again, digital, and you guys have probably seen these studies before, and there's huge, I can send you some studies on this, where the digital brain training games, you get better at the games just from practice, but it does, there's minimal, if any, real world changes because it's not interfacing with the real world. Tasks get better, but real world minimal trainer. Um, and it's also a bad treatment protocol because it isolates. We don't want people sitting and looking at a screen. We want them interacting with other people. When you interact with other people, obviously, your mood raises, um, teamwork improves, and communication, and so forth. We also found <clears throat> from our, our research that the progressive stimulation, one of the changes it makes physically in the brain is increases postsynaptic receptors, right, which happens, again, almost immediately, but starts to solidify in as little as 20 minutes with the right type of, of stimulation. The brain will change physically to handle the load. One of those is by increasing postsynaptic receptors and also other is stimulating long-term potentiation. So learning is faster and memory is better. Um, and so the other great thing and the research there, as you probably well know, is the brain will rewire around damage, which is really incredible. So what it meant is we could focus on improving the, um, connections of the brain critical to executive function and not worry about the damage because the brain will rewire around the damage. We don't have to focus on the damage, we just route around it. Um, the other thing we really wanted to do is we wanted to um, 
focus. So that was our process we're going to focus on this executive function. And we also added metronome. We've added a metronome for several of the exercises, which helps with, with training on um, mental timing, right? Which is also introduces an external stimulus. And if we speed up the metronome, we can actually simulate decision making under stress. So that's a great way for obviously for people going to stressful environments. And we also in, in coordinate um, hands and feet both different rhythms. Some of the most recent uh, research you might be aware of is how drummers have much more efficient connections between the left and the right hemisphere because they're doing different things with each side of the brain. So we add those motions in there again, along with the decision-making part of executive function. So basically targeted neuroplasticity training is trying to uh, target, um, the, the training is gonna target critical parts of executive function but we want to avoid the traditional approaches with research approaches which tip like are reductionist right we want to find one thing see what it makes a difference and extrapolate it out and see if it's going to test the problem with that of course is that that might work in a short amount of time but the more parts of the brain the more um, protocols we can engage at the same time the better the opportunity we have to help people so the targeted part is targeting executive function right decision making planning by making decisions now, some of the sub-processes that we, in our framework that are involved in this are analysis and synthesis, right? The ability to analyze um, information, to break it down, and also synthesize it into something new. Pattern recognition is huge. Um, data throughput, if we can speed up data throughput, we can actually make these things happen faster. And focus and attention, obviously, is huge. One of the biggest problems, obviously, in our society today is lack of focus and attention. So we can help that as well. The neuroplasticity part is, as you know, is, is neurons that fire together, wire together. If we change the brain using the, the principles of neuroplasticity, it will make those connections faster. And the more parts of the brain that we engage when we do this, the broader the improvements. And then the training. So progressive resistance for the, for the brain, right? We want to make the brain work harder and harder each time. But the, the art part of this is we always want to make the brain work a little bit harder each iteration, but never too hard that it gets discouraging. So people feel very positive. That's why we've had success with people with depression as well. So we give the brain a very simple task and it does all the work for us, creating the connections necessary to accomplish that task. We also have unlimited variations. So each variation is designed to work different parts of executive function. We can just build on them to a touch. So if someone is struggling in one area, we can adjust the exercises to make sure that those are the areas that we target first so that they get the fastest improvement. So I'll give you an example here. So this is one of the exercises we use. We actually are very basic. We have lots of symbols or arrows because arrows are the simplest decision that require um, a simple symbol that require a decision. And we can add lots of data in those arrows, colors, directions, numbers. So the idea of using different parts of the brain at the same time um, is an example here. I'll give you this example um, where someone's going to read off that first line. So making decisions, a different decision on each one of those arrows is using a different part of the brain. And then here we also work for speed. The speed of processing, uh, especially people with slow executive function, this is huge. So here's someone doing the same, just the directions as fast as possible. Now, obviously, that's with a lot of practice, but that's 120 decisions in about 10 seconds. So our first, going back to our first study, right? So this is, we had the worst platoon of battalion called the Suicide King. Three attempts before um, we even started working with them, really rampant PTSD due to six, the loss of 16 guys a cycle before. Bottom of their class, um, worried that they weren't even going to be able to deploy. They were doing so poorly. So the protocol, again, I embedded with the, with the platoon while I developed the different exercises and we had the control group. And over three months, we were able to refine the exercises to be as simple as possible, just a few used in a very uh, numerous ways to improve the brain. The assessment results were pretty impressive. This is the cognitive skills test we took before and after. So the trainee average was much was much higher than the than the um, than the control group, but more importantly than that, the real world results. So no more behavioral issues um, at their final pre-deployment training. 
the instructor said it was the best performance he'd ever seen. So that's what we were looking for, right? Real world results. Second protocol, um, second study was designed by one of those instructors at the school, basically marksmanship, because it's objective, right? You, you either shoot, hit the target, or you don't. We had a control group, and a, again, a control group and a trainee group. Um, the results, again, it was written up actually in the Marine Magazine, average of 23% improvement over the control group, um, just in marksmanship. Um, and then the third study, again, scout sniper course, very, very difficult. 46% uh, dropout rate with our two groups, back-to-back um, -back courses, we had only one drop per class, um, and every class afterwards went back to the standard. So that was kind of our test, right? The, the, our, our test groups did significantly better. When we removed the protocol, they went back to traditional, um, the traditional results. So without MPT, it returned to pre-experiment um, scores. Mental recovery, and this is area we're talking about, right? How we can help people. So post-traumatic stress disorder, obviously a significant issue. Um, and so we've had some significant uh, improvements with people, again, using the same protocol. This is one of my favorites. This is the one that really started me helping people with mental issues. I was in Quantico training the rifle and pistol teams, ran into Gunny Lehu. So his, his neuropsych score as measured by the doctors were from, from 35 to 97 in about a month. In fact, they retest them, they didn't believe it. Um, and so ongoing military, so we've done, again, mostly it's performance improvement, so SEALs, pilots, EOD, all these things, but every group we've ever worked with, if they deployed in more than, deployed more than a couple times, there's ramp of PTSD, and, and feedback would be something like, you know, I always get angry at my guys, I don't get angry anymore. Right, anger is one of the signs of PTSD. So then we moved to the civilian program so when military funding got cut, and we've had again some 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 significant. We've done work with thousands of people, but significant ones was Mark, terrible hypoxia at birth, um, two to three hour courses of instruction with his practice, and then he, you know, from from being in remedial courses his whole life, he was able to get um, the first A in a non remedial class, finish the year with two A's and three B's. Inner city high school, again, rampant PTSD in the inner city. This is in Chicago. Um, we, we had changed it up a little bit. I didn't lead the exercise. I had one of the teachers lead the exercises, showed them how to do it very simply. Three times a week, 15 minutes over the course of eight weeks, and their ACT scores went up three full points. So they went from the lowest to the highest in the school, and behavior issues went down, and their grades went up. Another case study was a young man with a traumatic brain injury. He was at Recovery Institute of Chicago, very, very, um, uh, frustrated with his progress. They had him doing typical stuff, right? Sudoku, writing out sentences, and very, very uh, frustrated. A friend of his who I'd helped, who had a concussion from uh, lacrosse. I started working with Rick, Richie, and after a few weeks, he took his re and required neuropsych test for his driver's license, and they told him he did so well, he aced it, he didn't have to do um, rehab anymore. The first time after our first session when he had to write out his sentences, he did it in one third of the time he did before um, the brain training. Uh, senior care, right? Senior is another issue. Uh, um, seniors, you know, their mind starts to go dementia. So we work with seniors again um, at this uh, senior care facility in California. Most popular class ever. I actually did a, a kind of a seminar at a senior care facility here in Chicago, um, Lutheran Homes, um, a few months ago. And we had 188 seniors show up. Um, they normally have 35 to their events, and all of them were doing these exercises together as a group. They absolutely loved it. Robert, depression, we talked about depression. Um, when I first started working with Robert, I do, I work most of my work is via Zoom, uh, Skype, and FaceTime remotely. Slouched over in the so corner of a sofa, very depressed. His mom was begging me to start working with him. We started working with him, and five weeks later, haircut, shave, was looking for work. So. This was a couple of years ago. I checked in on him last year. He lost 100 pounds and has a full-time job. His mom can't believe it. TBI recovery, we work a lot of people with TBI. So again, it, you know, there's all kinds of tests, but we're looking for real-world improvements. These are the kind of things we get from TBI recovery. Learning disabilities, this young girl completely changed her life around. She'd been held back several times. Um, and after three of the sessions, um, raised her hand for the first time in class, got it right, and so her life was on a much different trajectory. Again, and they're fun. So she's a young child. This is a Getty image, but a young girl, she was 12, um, made a big difference for her. 
post brain surgery recovery. This is a woman I work with here in Evanston, written up in the North Shore Hospital, her husband, and she said that the only thing that made any difference was the brain training. And she made tremendous, tremendous improvements very, very quickly. Um, to be, be able to go through not being able to even cook or follow a recipe to within 12 weeks to be able to cook entire Thanksgiving dinner for her family made a huge difference for her. This was a girl that a friend of my daughter's when we were doing when with the Marines, 14 uh, or non 12 um, non cancerous brain tumors, obviously physical damage, low IQ, same thing, right? The brain rewires around damage. And her mom said her improvement in school were tremendous. Um, ben, this is my last case study here. I never tried this before, cerebral palsy, because again, when we engage, if you saw those two videos, you, they're using their hands as well, right? We want to engage. The connections between the brain and the hands as well. Ben cerebral palsy had never been able to use his hands effectively. Um, after you know several sessions, after four weeks, so probably about seven sessions, um, his processing speed was from two and a half down to under a minute, and he could use both hands. So it's amazing, right? So um, he's, the first time he was a, he couldn't even fold a piece of paper. Now he can fold a piece of paper, and he sent me this email. He said, "I can open a bottle." Of Open a bottle, bottle opener and package it back without smashing him. He's a college kid, right? So he loved, he's completely changed his life because we've re-energized the connections from his brains to his from his brain to his hands. So kind of to summarize, I've worked with everybody, thousands of people, everything from schools to ministries to military to athletes. I still work with professional athletes, a lot of which who have concussions. I've got 12 years of solid results applying this kind of a unique approach to the brain. Um, and so in conclusion, you know, everyone we've ever worked with has made improvements. We've got Marines, we've got kids. The Lo if you guys from around here, the Loyal Ramblers, I worked with that basketball team before they went to the Final Four. There's a picture of 180 seniors in the room, and there's um, Helen Bischoff, the daughter of one of the Marines uh, that I befriended in Iraq, and she's four doing, those er doing that exercise. So anyone can become certified and trained. Um, it's very easy, it's a very, very easy program. Again, we want the interface to be as simple as possible um, while it makes the maximum number of changes to the brain as possible. So, questions? <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much, John. That was an excellent talk. Um, I want to open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, I do have one question that was um, brought in the chat queue. Um, the question is, do you plan to conduct a clinical trial so you can determine if these gains are due to the treatment versus natural recovery or any other kind of intense attention? I would actually love to do a clinical trial, and that's why I'm hoping you, one of you guys has a trial we can part. See, because I'm a practitioner, I just do this. I help people. Almost all my work is referrals, so if they refer me, people come to me with these problems. I haven't, you know, I don't ha really have the um, the facilities to do a clinical trial, though I would. Although it's a good question about that. Although, you know, the, Richie's neuro, um, uh, the one who made such rapid re uh, recovery, um, he actually, I talked to his uh, neurologist, and his neurologist said that um, they believe that the brain heals slowly anyway, and over the course of a year, um, that it would recover, which Richie would, would flat out refuse to believe because obviously he made such changes so fast. So uh, we know it's, I mean, just based on the neuroscience that involved in how the brain changes and be, because we've worked with so many different people with so many different issues and 100% of them have made improvements. So, um, so definitely I would say it's not natural recover, recovery. A lot of people we work with are in other kind of recovery scenes or just even, the, even those school kids uh, in Chicago. I mean, they were, they were struggling like everybody else and they made tremendous improvements in over those eight weeks. Great, thank you. So I'll, I'll unmute the lines now so that others can ask questions. Well, I have a, um, a question. Um, so it looks like this is really promising, um, you know, results where you've 
been able to implement this in a variety of populations. Um, and looking through the, um, the descriptions of the different types of samples you used, it looks like a lot of different types of doses were used. Um, so I don't know if, you know, helping those who might be interested in using this in a controlled trial in the future, um, have you found that, um, you know, the number of training sessions um, needed to change depending on um, the person's um, situation? Or yes, and that's actually, it's a great question. And, 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 and that's why um, to date, the training is done, you know, in person because we need to adjust that. You're absolutely right. Someone with, um, like I'm working with a woman now who's 84. So, um, so I worked with her son and he's making great progress. He had me work with his mother who had a, a head injury last year. So she is much, she's a couple of sessions behind where he is now. She's making progress, but it, that has to be adjusted. And that's the art part of this. So the science is the exercises. Anybody can do the, the exercises. But as you just pointed out, everybody's a little different. Um, most people, um, you know, I track everything every time I work. So some people start off faster, some people start off slower. Um, and the art part then is to adjust it. So it's always a challenge, a little bit of a challenge, but not too much of a challenge. And so that's true. So some people will require longer, some people require different variations. We have several different types of exercise and tools we can use to customize. Um, we always start with the same one, a very simple one, and we, and we can assess kind of where they are going through that first exercise, then we just adjust accordingly as we progress. Great. Um, so I have some other questions that have popped up in the chat boxes. Um, have you seen anyone that has not responded to this treatment? No, and that's what's pretty amazing. I know that you're not supposed to say that <laughs> in research, right? But it hasn't. And if you think about it, in a way, because we're, uh, you know, kind of attempting to do for the brain, we do with the body, it would be almost like saying, have you ever met anybody who lifted weights and didn't get stronger? We know because of the physiology of the body that that's impossible. And for after, over the course of 12 years, we realize the same thing as with the brain with this specific type of exercise. And there's others obviously that can be good, but this, the robust stimulation, non-digital exercises, targeting executive function, we've never had anybody who has, and we have money back guarantee. So we've never had anybody not make improvements. Right, so the next question I have here on the chat box is, um, can you please review the treatment protocol again so that I can better understand the intervention. And I would say for the sake of time, maybe keep it kind of brief. Um, yeah, the, the protocol, so we start with um, those arrows, like those arrows you saw when the, the, the two examples, um, we start very, very simple and we actually make have them make decisions and we adjust that based on their starting baseline. So um, they start to make decisions that's improving executive function. In order to do that, they have to analyze that. all those sub processes they have to use to make those decisions. We always say them out loud, eyes, ears, and mouth have to be involved. Again, so we add the hands to use both hemispheres of the brain. So we gradually add more parts of the brain, but we start, the interface is always very, very simple, just like that, just making very simple decisions. Does that answer the question? I think so. Um, yeah, it's Lynn, and I can, having done it, I can maybe contribute a little bit as well. So, I mean, a simple level might just be um, to, to, to state the direction of the arrows as fast as you can. And then adding complexity, you would state the direction and then alternate between direction and color, for example. Exactly. Um, and then you might add in the tapping with that. So it starts off simple and the, the goal is to do it as fast as possible. From my experience, having done it with John. Yeah, and, and you're right. And the reason we have those variables because color and direction are different parts of the brain, right? So we're, we're making those connections across and then we continue to add more parts to increase, you know, the, the constellation of connections throughout the brain. That's right. I remember Lynn, you did that. That's right. All right. Our next question is how can one become a certified trainer? Um, contact me. We have a certification program. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, 
we, um, we, and we can do it in person, we can do it remote. Most of my work actually is remote using Zoom, um, you know, which is just like GoToMeeting. And uh, we've certified people on both coasts already. Great. Um, that's all the questions I saw on the chat. Oh, let's see. We, one more popped up. Um, I have a question about, oops, beginning when you created the program. In percentage, how much it was based on your observation and how much on science? And now do you modify the current protocol? Again, how much based on observation and how much on new research evidence? Um, yeah, in the beginning it was uh, observation, right? So in, in the, the application development world, there's something called test-driven test development, right? You test something and then you take what works and you add and add and add to it. And that's kind of the iteration we did. We actually, um, that initial research out of MIT was all we had to go on when we started. But obviously since, you know, we're constantly researching and finding out why these things are happening. But, but you're right, it was basically, we tried this, it worked, and then we wanted to figure out why it worked. And All actually right. now, so research, basically, you know, I'm constantly researching if there's something, some new research that we can integrate into the program, we'll add it to the program. <laughs> Um, so we have another question here. What kind of patients will you not admit into the program? Never not admitted anybody. So it's interesting. Uh, people ask me, can, I, can you help? I say, you know, I can't promise, but I'm willing to give it a try because I want to see how many people we can help, and which is great. It's opened it up. I'm working with some of Parkinson's right now. So his uh, involuntary mo motions are going away. I've worked with people with strokes, uh, learning disabilities. Um, I won't, you know, I, I try nobody away because I want to see the limits of the program. And again, so far, everybody's made um, improvements. Great. Wonderful. Any any other questions? All right. Well, this has been a, such a lively discussion. I want you to take the opportunity to take down um, John's information here on the screen, if you haven't already and you'd like to, um, because I'm gonna take back the screen so that I can advertise our webinar series where this is going to be archived. Great, yes, please, anybody reach out to me, um, email me, call me, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great, so. All right. So um, thank you all for such a lively discussion and participation. I, th I think this has been the most highly attended webinar we've had yet, um, which is wonderful, kicking off the um, year very well, and obviously very engaging talk and, um, and so forth. Um, so I wanna draw your attention to the webinar um, paid for archiving these. Um, so we have, um, this is a, if you just Google ACRM um, neuroplasticity webinars, you'll come to this page, but the um, URL is here at the top of the page as well. Um, but we have um, highlighted, oops, we've highlighted a host of topics in the past. This is our upcoming one here that we just had today and we'll be archiving, um, putting up the recording as well soon. Um, but here are our past webinars as well of other um, topics. Um, so we really encourage you guys to check this out. Um, and um, you know, if you have others, other colleagues that you think might enjoy this talk, please pass along this URL to them so that they can check out this wonderful talk as well. So with that, thank you all for joining and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.